welcome to the Quilt Folk Show and Tell. I'm your host, Jenny Smith, and here we are on episode six. Today, the three films come from very interesting sources of inspiration from ancient traditions, antique quilts, and vintage photography. You're going to learn something new, see some amazing projects, and meet some wonderful makers. And please hang around at the end because I've got a favour to ask of you. First up, I am talking to my friend Debs Maguire with her Midsummer Whole Cloth Quilt. I live in um, the Chiltern Hills, which are kind of low-lying chalky hills that run um, between London and Oxford. All of those quilting, you know, um, skills that got thrown into the melting pot that is America, they all came from somewhere you know so they came from Europe they came from Africa they you know that there was this just this huge kind of um confluence of different ideas all coming together and what came out was the kind of classic block patchwork that we see in America now um but those same threads you know that kind of traveled across the sea to America you know they they still also continued in our country um and so I really enjoy being able to tell those stories you know the quilts that stayed here the quilts that um, the communities that took on, you know, those sorts of ideas and made new, new quilts. I've always um, been a hand quilter, but I've always used um, a hoop. And I'm also a historian. And so I've been reading and looking at pictures of people quilting in the traditional frame. And it's sort of like walking in the steps, you know, of, of how people created quilts in the past. And that solves loads of historical problems for me because it lets me understand why um, quilt patterns look like they did um, because of the constraints of the format that people were quilting in. I'm calling the quilt that's in my frame at the moment um, my midsummer quilt because I started it on um, the 24th of June and so I've set myself like the kind of mental target that I'll try and finish it by midwinter. <laughs> um, it's based on a quilt from 1820 or 1830 and um, it appears in a book and so um, I've always really loved this quilt because it has such an interesting um, pattern, but it's almost like disguise. So whenever it's shown in books, it's shown from the side, which is all pieced out of chintz. So it's really kind of dark colors, like a, almost like a big kind of star shape frame quilt. And the quilting is there, but you can't really see it. But the back was this pale cream and the back looks, you know, like mine does. So with the same kind of really intricate quilting. And I really love that idea of like playing with what's the front and what's the back. Um, because like we modern day, we call the front the piece side, yeah? Because that's like where all the nice fabric is. And, um, but was that the front? We don't, we don't really know, you know, how did they use it? Was, or was it the other side? Because to quilt it, they would have had to have worked from this light side. You know, you couldn't have made a design this complex um, uh, mixed in with all that kind of um, patterned fabric. You haven't pricked your finger and bled on it then that would be my worst no. <laughs> <laughs> I have three children and two dogs and you know so my house is not <laughs> it's not a it's not a pristine uh, quilt show environment so no I haven't bled on it yet but um I, I quilt um using like the rocking stitch so the kind of traditional quilting stitch um so I use um two thimbles I don't know if you can see those there um, and rock the needle between the two and so you actually don't really prick your finger doing that you know it's it's um I never really touch the end of the needle because you know that the rocking nature of it means that I balance the needle between those two thimbles and just rock from side to side so it's a really different um kind of stitching to actually holding a needle and sewing my stitches are not st always straight my drafting is not always perfect um and in fact, you know, a lot of quilts like this, where I take the pattern from the past, I'll use, um, you know, kind of like digital, um, you know, drawing apps and things like that to, to trace the patterns from a digital image. And so I'm basically just making all the same mistakes that they did, you know, and, and I kind of think, well, that's, that's the pleasure of it. You know, when I get to like a messy corner, I think, well, shall I straighten this out? And I think, well, well no, why? You know, I mean, it, it, that wasn't how it was supposed to be. You know, people think about um, hand quilting as being quite rigid or, or quite controlled, but I always make the analogy that it's almost like the opposite of that. You know, so the idea that you're um, when you're making something in patchwork, it's almost like starting off with um, like gridded paper. You know, like everything's got to fit into a square somehow, and even if you're kind of messing with that, you know, it's still effectively a grid. Whereas um, hand quilting is 
is just a blank piece of paper you know like you could create any pattern on there you could create any design I find a lot of pleasure in making quilts you know so piecing and sewing machines and all of those sorts of things but the bit for me that's almost kind of spiritual I suppose is is the hand quilting because there's something about that um, method of rocking the um, needle between the two fingers which is very soothing and I I find that in order to kind of you know just live the rest of my life that I have if I haven't got some quilting around it everything just gets a little bit more jagged <laughs> and so this is really just like a, a way of um you know kind of creating a bit of time for me you know and the thing part of the reason why I think I'm so sort of beguiled by the history is because when you look back into history and you look at the few times because women didn't often write about what they were doing you know like they're quilting because it, it would have been like saying uh, you know writing in your diary that you clean the kitchen floor you know like it it was so commonplace that it was just not worth mentioning but when it is mentioned it's often mentioned in relation to periods of like emotional stress and and very often it comes up because women are talking about how sewing helped them to mediate their feelings, you know, um, and a lot of that is tied up in how they were taught to sew as children, you know, so as little girls, you were given sewing because it it made you sit quietly and, you know, and there's a there's a really kind of negative feminist story around that. But then maybe the other side of it that we're seeing more and more now in our kind of world where like mindfulness and mental health is much more important. We're kind of looking at that anew and saying, well, actually maybe that was a tool, you know, maybe that was an emotional tool for kind of regulating your feelings in life, you know, and we all still need that and do that. I'm now talking to Maggie in Sarasota in Florida with her chestnut vendor. I've been in Sarasota my whole life, uh, except for when I went to college. I was in St. Augustine, so I was still in Florida among marshland. So I can see alligators and birds and different, different animals. And it's just calming. I love to celebrate old images. And what I really enjoy about them is that people aren't necessarily looking at the camera. It's not that selfie that we're so used to. So I love focusing on people who are actually doing what they would normally do and just making an ordinary moment special. When I was 11, my friend uh, taught me how to make a traditional quilt and she was also 11. So you can imagine how that turned out. <laughs> but then I, um, when I went away to college, I started working in a quilt shop and I was doing um, fine art. I was working on a fine art degree. And once I got towards the end of my degree, it was kind of like, okay, find your own voice now. So I started playing with fabrics rather than paint and drawing and things like that. And it just kind of morphed into this kind of thing. I'm obsessed with vintage imagery. Um, so I go through various different websites. Um, this one came from the Library of Congress, so it's not copywritten. Um, so what I did was I pulled this guy out and I named him Wilbur. I have no idea what his real name is, but he's a, he's a chestnut vendor from, I think it was like 1910 or 1912. So apparently he was from Baltimore. So I was trying to look up different street scenes from Baltimore. And so I just blew up one that I really enjoyed. It, it was a vacant shop, it looked like. Um, so I'm going to put the little you know, knickknacks and doodads and things that are in the window. I just haven't gotten to that yet. I build mine up kind of in a sculptural effect. So when I start working, um, I always start with my subject. So the skin tones usually have between seven and sometimes 11 different layers to them. And I start with the highlights and I build backwards. So the layers keep getting bigger and bigger and bigger as I build up. So it actually gets quite thick. Um, so I don't use any fusible or anything like that. I, I use very fine um, pins and then I sew right over top of them. Um, so it's, it kind of feels like a, sculpt, a sculpture. So I've got the, the shadow is always the last part, which, you know, when you look at your face, that's actually how it happens. So it just logically made sense to me to put it together that way as well. So I like to keep as many wrinkles and, you know, different fun details in there as possible. And um, like I said, sometimes I am sewing through up to 11 layers at a time. So my sewing machine doesn't always like me, but, uh, <laughs> but it gets the job done. Yeah, there's no paint, it's just thread and batik fabric, just layered up. If I don't do something creative, I feel like I don't really have much to show for my day. So it's very, very important that I have at least a little bit of something to show for my, my time. But she's crazy because being a mom is, is a full-time job, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, I take advantage of nap time for sure. <laughs> I wouldn't necessarily call myself a perfectionist. Um, I get frustrated really easily and I have no patience, but for some reason with this, it's just, 
calming to me. And I can, I can just keep experimenting with it until the pieces come together the way that I want it to. Of course, when a needle breaks or, you know, a pin bends or things like that, you know, that's kind of frustrating, but for some reason, this is just, it feels like home to me. It really doesn't matter that much to me, how many hours it takes. It's just how much, how much time was I able to be in the studio and enjoy that time. And then I can move on to my next character that I can imagine their story and celebrate them as well. Finally, I'm speaking to Maurice in Paris, who's talking about Pojagi or Korean patchwork. Uh, the name of this garden is uh, Martin Luther King. This is really different from Paris gardens. And this is a peaceful place where a lot of people can go, young, old and children. I'm working on Bojagi, and, uh, which is a Korean ancestral traditional uh, art in Korea, very old, really almost 14th or 15th century. And um, Bojagi was something for wrapping things. And uh, I heard in an exhibition from a Korean woman um, in Musée Guimet in Paris, who told that uh, Bojagi came from a Chinese ideogram, which means uh, clothes for things. This is the Arc de Triomphe actually wrapped and this could be a bojagi. So I'm doing this technique um, since um, maybe 12, 10 or 12 years now. I discovered this and uh, I was completely fascinated by the transparency. They put them sometimes in a kind of loosey presentation and that's um, Bojagi is, is alive and um, I think it's always very very elegant yeah because the light change and uh, and um, all along the day the Bojagi is always different. The two I have here uh, are made with a French seam or couture anglaise for me. The red one, um, it's, you have a very simple path, uh, like a, a road here in, uh, in this area, in this part. And this is, uh, like my, my road or your road, or, but I wanted something peaceful. And those waves were, uh, the world around us, which is sometimes difficult and, um, hard to live or to, to understand, working on my stitches and I don't think to nothing. And this is really a kind of a medi meditation, yeah. The white one, I put this kind of leaf, or uh, I prefer the idea of the boat, which is um, a very, always or again a very peaceful place in exhibition people uh, told me um, when i look at your work um, i am in a very peaceful place uh, i feel the wind blowing or i am very far from here because you bring us very far well so that's enough for me it's nice that the the red Pojagi shows this road and this journey and actually discovering this craft for you has led you to different places around the world and to new people, hasn't it? For me, it's more than a craft. For me, it's, um, it's a way of meeting people, of getting richer every day and uh, to have so many surprises very often. This is, uh, this is really part of my life, yes, yes. And... Uh, when I began, I could not imagine how far I could go with Bojagi, really. A very big thank you to Debs, Maggie and Maurice for those insightful films and thoughts. Lots to think about as always with the Quilt Folk virtual show and tell and a nice little trip around the world seeing alligators and 
British countryside and French landmarks as well. It's really good fun making these programs. And now what I wanted to say is that if any of you have quilt based items that come out when you celebrate the holidays in December and Thanksgiving, Christmas, however you celebrate, I'd love to hear about them. I want to put a little montage together for the next show and tells of things all around the world and objects, what they mean to people and how they are used in these celebrations. So if you've got some ideas, please send me an email and some photos to jenny at quiltfolk.com and I will see you all again soon.